beautiful friends. I hope you're all doing incredibly well. I just decided to do a little bit of a cozy vlog, I guess. I'm currently rereading my favorite book, which I'll talk about in just a second. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas and a good New Year. I haven't filmed anything in quite a while. I filmed my last two videos on the same day, so I haven't actually sat down in front of a camera in a while, so sorry if I'm weird. <laughs> But like I said, I just wanted to have a cozy today and I mean that like fully. As I had stated before, I am rereading my favorite book right now and I am loving it so, so, so very much. And I'm sure if you've been here a while, you already know what I'm talking about. But my favorite book is Once Upon a Wardrobe by Patty Callahan. The first vlog that I ever did, first reading vlog that I ever did on this channel was for this book and I didn't finish it in that video so I didn't actually get to give my final thoughts on it but I will this time, I assure you. But I've never reread a book before and I'm officially a big, big fan of it because I already have twice as many tabs as I did before. I've only made it to page 100 so far because I'm actually reading this with a couple of friends that I have on Instagram and I am so excited for them to read it, but I'm only 100 pages in and look at how many tabs I have. I have so many and this is like as many tabs as I have throughout the whole book the first time I read it. It's so cool reading it the second time. It's like you're picking up on so much once you know what the ending result is and I'm mentally preparing myself for that. <laughs> but I'm also taking out like all the neon tabs that I had from the first time that I read it and I'm replacing it with color-coded ones because I of course color code all of my things. But as I said before, if you've been here a while, you know that this is my favorite book so you've heard me talk about it before. But if you haven't, I am again going to explain the synopsis. So this follows our main character Megs and she is a very intellectual person. She's a student at Oxford and this is also based in I think the 50s, 40s, 50s around that time frame. And she has a little brother named George who is very very sick. He doesn't actually have very long to live but he is currently obsessed with the story of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and he loves it so much and he's just so imaginative and he's so pure and I just absolutely adore this little boy so much but he wants to know where Narnia came from and so because this is in the time frame of like the 40s and 50s at that time C.S. Lewis himself actually was a lecturer at Oxford so Megs gets to see him every once in a while on campus and so George asks her will you please 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 find out where Narnia came from and Megs being a very intellectual like mathematician physics kind of a person uh, she doesn't understand this request, but she does it anyway because she loves her brother more than anything. And so she asks C.S. Lewis where it came from, and he is not giving her a direct answer. He's just giving her stories of his life and how he came to writing and all of this. So she's having a hard time receiving it because, like I said, being such an intellectual and mathematical person, this is really making sense to her. So she is just on her own journey of figuring out that not everything has to be an equation and there are just so many good quotes in this book obviously you can tell by all the tabs that I have that really kind of explain that concept and I think it's just so beautiful. I wish I could read you all of these quotes because they're all so lovely and beautiful but I cannot. <laughs> There's also a subtle romance in here. Megs does meet a boy and it's really beautiful and I just I don't know, it's just so deep and I cannot recommend it enough. It gives you such a warm, beautiful, cozy feeling and I just love it. I will talk more about it as I read on because I do plan on reading a little bit more in this video, of course, but I just, just get it. Just get it. And it's a cozy winter read, so you can read it January, February, March, you know, Minnesota, we have all the snow, otherwise it does make a good story to read around Christmas time, but I just love this book. So much and I've already cried like five times and like I said I'm only like 100 pages in. <laughs> but anyway so yeah I'm very excited about that. I'm a big fan of rereading now and I just love it. So I do want to do a little bit of a bible study. I am still currently working through the book of John and as you can see I have so many notes and annotations in here and truly the only reason why I do is because I use the app called the Enduring Word app. I use it on my iPad, I have it on my phone of course for reference and stuff, but because of that app I'm able to take so many wonderful, beautiful notes about the word and I've learned so 
so so so so much oh my gosh it is so incredibly helpful i take notes in this notebook and i just i cannot recommend that app enough so if you're somebody who maybe already studies the bible or wants to start and doesn't know where to start I highly encourage you to download the Enduring Word app because it has helped me, like I said, understand so much, learn so much. It's kind of a compilation of commentaries from the man who created it named David Gusick, I think his name is. But then he also has input from really big faith leaders like Charles Spurgeon and Clark and so many other wonderful faith leaders. So I really encourage you to download that. It has been life changing for me. And then the last thing is journaling. I have my wonderful, beautiful journal that Steven got me a while ago. I have some Elvish written in there right now, but I haven't actually started to fill this one out. I have some prayers that I wrote down for the new year, but other than that, this one is completely empty. So I want to start journaling stuff because I have a habit of just like randomly venting when I should just be journaling. So I will be journaling all of my thoughts and feelings and I'm very excited about that. So anyway, I will not blabber on for too much longer. This is already a very long intro, but I just wanted to let you know what this video would be all about. So I'm going to start my Bible study really quick, plug my camera in because it's flashing at me that it's about to die, and then I will catch you guys up on stuff in a little bit. I wanted to show you guys some things that I got from Mr. Pen, which is my favorite company for like annotating stuff. It's where I get all of my highlighters and pens and stuff like that. So I wanted to share them with you. Um, I get other pens as well, but I also really enjoy this brand. <laughs> Don't chew on that. But Mr. Pen reached out to me on Instagram and asked if they could send me a package, which I happily said yes to. Sorry, Oakley is like digging on the ground trying to get a toy underneath a cupboard. Hang on. <laughs> okay, so they sent me a lot of really wonderful things that I wanted to share with you guys and a few things that I'll be gifting as well. But first thing is this really cute little lavender pen case. It's got this front little pocket. No, it doesn't. It's got a pocket on the inside, which is really nice. And then it also has this little handle on the side to carry it around, which is super handy. And I really like having clear cases. I mean, I like patterned ones too, but clear cases are nice when you have a lot of annotating supplies like me. Um, they also sent me a few packages of highlighters, which is really exciting because I love highlighters. And they don't just have like neon ones, they have really nice colors. So the first set, is this one right here and it's got some nice pinks but then it's also got this really pretty green one and this brownish one and I just really like the tones of these and I'm really excited to use these ones in my bible or maybe another book if it matches because of course I match everything and then these ones are really really cool I absolutely love the color of these ones but look how fun shaped they are. I just really love the unique shape of these ones, which is really fun. These other highlighters, I actually bought these ones before, but I wanted to show them to you guys anyways, because these are actually my favorite highlighters that I own. 
and of course by Mr. Penn, but aren't they beautiful? I love the dark moody colors, of course. The green is so pretty. They show up a lot darker than the caps, but they're so stunning and I love them so much. I'm currently using these in my Bible and if I find a book that is worthy, then maybe I'll use them in the book as well. But I absolutely love, 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 love these ones. And I also like that, like the head of them, um, it kind of, oh, you can't really focus. There we go. It kind of like bends a little bit when you put pressure down on it, which I really like. So I really, really love these ones. They sent me these beautiful pens, which I think are so pretty. The golden caps. These are really pretty and they're really like soft and they're kind of heavy, but they're definitely really good quality. Also, Mr. Pen is like super affordable, which is really nice. Like the highlighter sets anywhere from like five to eight dollars. So I really appreciate that. These next two, I'm actually gonna be gifting to my friend Casey. She doesn't know it yet. This is a Bible journaling kit. It's got these really pretty gel pens. I don't know if these ones are colored or if they're black ink, but they're really pretty regardless. And then these beautiful um, like wax highlighters so they don't bleed in your Bible at all. She has a very like light and pretty aesthetic and I think she would really like these. So I'll be sending these to her. And then I also got these blank notebooks and I'm gonna be sending this one to her as well. I printed her name on it and a really pretty flower but I don't know, I think I've talked about her on here before, but we met on Instagram like, gosh, I don't know, maybe three years ago? I'm not even sure. We met a few years ago on Instagram, but she had followed me and um, after she had kind of interacted a little bit, I was like, maybe I should check her out. And I went to her page and I was like, oh my goodness, it's so pretty and she's so pretty and she's so nice and we just, kind of got to know each other and then actually this past summer we got to meet in person for the first time because she actually only lives like two two and a half hours north of where I live we were up there to go to one of Steven's friends MMA fights and I just messaged her and I was like hey would you like be open to maybe getting together for breakfast tomorrow I know this is super short notice but we're up north and I figured I'd ask and she took it a step further and she was like well why don't you guys just come over and I was like this is so cool, but um, unfortunately I was really really dehydrated that weekend and wasn't feeling very well and I have severe social anxiety like literally leaving my house I get a stomach ache So of course I got like sick on the way there like I was feeling like pretty good and excited and then like once we Like were literally down the street. I thought I was gonna throw up <laughs> And so I messaged her and I was like, are you sure you still want us to come over? Like, I'm not feeling very well. And she was like, no, please come over. You're already all the way here. Like, I will take care of you. And she was so kind and gave me like a cold rag to put on my neck, which helped so much. And it was so embarrassing for that to be like the first time we met. <laughs> But it was also so nice because it really showed her character of how kind she is and how good of a friend she's become because we actually became pen pals earlier last year, I think, as well, which was just the best thing. I just absolutely love her. I can honestly say she's like my best friend pretty much um, and it's just the best thing in the world. She's just been such a good friend to me and she is so inspiring. Like she's so kind and loving and compassionate and she also is a believer which of course i love and it's been so nice to be able to chat with her about that and learn from her and i don't know if her instagram is private or not if it's not i'm i'll put her name so you can see who i'm talking about um a few of my bookish friends have actually followed her which is really cool but she is just such a wonderful person and I love her so dearly and she's one of those people where it's like and I don't want this to sound bad but it's like I wish I was better because like I feel like she's so just further ahead in me and so much and like I look up to her you know so sometimes I'm like gosh I can't believe she's my friend like she's so much better than I am you know like she's just so mature she's a mom she has two little boys she's just one of those people that like makes me want to be better and I'm like dang I need to like get my life together and be better and be more mature because she is <laughs> kind of random but I just wanted to show you this stuff they sent me a few other things too like some paperclip stuff and some um, some more pens but 
this is kind of the main gist of the stuff and I just really wanted to show you guys this. I'm really excited to send it to her. I hope she loves it. But yeah, so anyway, that is all about my friend Casey, whom I love so dearly. And if you're watching this, I hope you never get annoyed by me telling you how much I appreciate your friendship because it's just the best thing. So anyway, if you don't have a friend like that, I encourage you to find one. I think it's really important to have friends who inspire us and encourage us to be better and I don't feel like that about her like I wish I was better because she makes me feel that way at all like she totally loves me where I'm at and appreciates me for who I am but I think just in my head sometimes I'm like gosh I need to be better if I'm going to be friends with her <laughs> anyway so yeah I am currently editing my videos and I figured I would just Take you along in here to see my kitchen which i haven't shown you guys in a hot minute my dream kitchen is from this instagram kev rose home i believe but they have what they call houselander because they're kind of like redoing their entire house to be like the set of outlander and it is the dreamiest thing i've ever seen in my life it is literally my dream kitchen they've got like Scottish Highlander vibes so they've got like these really beautiful stone walls in their kitchen and dark exposed beams and this beautiful old chandelier and copper pots and it's just like the moody dream come true and I would love to do that in our kitchen so yeah I am quite chatty today aren't I I think I'm just going to spend the rest of the day being a little bit cozy and relaxed. I did get some stuff accomplished today though. I washed dishes and did laundry and all of that stuff. So I don't feel like lazy, you know, because sometimes when I have cozy days, I feel bad because I'm not being productive. And I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with feeling like you should be using your time wisely, you know? Like I do think that rest should be honored and it is important, but sometimes like I still like to do a little bit something because that helps me relax you know like i i'm one of those people that can't totally relax unless i'm in like a clean environment so doing something like my dishes or laundry or vacuuming or wiping something down enables me to relax a lot more so anyway yes i'm gonna finish editing for a little bit and then read and then make some dinner so i might see you guys either later today or I'll see you tomorrow or in the next couple of days when I get a little bit further in my reading. Every time I get in bed, I can never get into bed by myself. He immediately comes in and lays on my legs every single time. Isn't he just the cutest thing? 
Oh, look at those eyes. Oh, I love him. I love him so much. Well, I just wanted to hop on here for an update with Once Upon a Wardrobe. I have my little, like, sunlight thingies. Like, I don't know what it's called. So that's why it looks red. <sighs> I'm loving it so much. I am such a big fan of rereading now. It is just like solidified my love all over again. I am highlighting and tabbing way, 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 way more than I was the first time because obviously now you pick up on different things. But um, just last night, I came across one of my favorite quotes that I highlighted highlighted <laughs> highlighted last time but it's mr c.s lewis and he says so differently we are created isn't that wonderful i love that line so much and then there was another part and gosh look at how much i am just like underlining and highlighting there's just so much gold in this book and it makes me so happy but there was another part i don't know if i'll be able to find it because of how many tabs i have in here but it is a quote that C.S. Lewis told Meg that he loves and that he's clung to. And it basically just says, like, all is all was well, all is well, and all will be well. She was talking to him about, like, the sadness of life and the things that you have to go through. And, and Mr. Lewis replied, and yet, all will be well. And I just think that is just such a beautiful philosophy for life. And... He quotes the person who originally says it, and of course I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to be able to find it because I have just so, so, so many <laughs> tabs in this book, but I am just loving it so much, and it is really kind of like solidifying a lot of what I was talking about before in regards to fairy tales and things of the like, which is actually something that has been on my mind a lot again lately. And kind of like I was saying before, I have a hard time like discerning whether something is like me being convicted about something or maybe something's just on my mind a lot because I suffer from obsessive thoughts <laughs> really bad. I'm sorry, Oakley is just like chewing on his foot so hard. So I'm sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> but yeah, the whole fairy tale thing and fantasy thing has been on my mind a lot lately again. And I'm praying about it because, of course, I think that I really did get my confirmation. Um, as I was talking about, I think like two or three videos ago, when I had mentioned that I had prayed about it. And literally the next day, an apologist that I follow on YouTube had posted a video about it. And basically confirmed everything that I was talking about. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically just like if it's okay for Christians to read and watch fantasy and things like that. Because... A lot of Christians are actually very against it, which I understand, but I have never been against it because I feel like I always see so much of Jesus in fantasy movies and books and biblical allegories and beautiful lessons. I had an aunt one time who is a Christian and she was very, very into like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and all that. And she was living with this other family at the time when she was moving from one state to another and the people that she was living with used to call her room the devil room because she had the Harry Potter books and movies and stuff and I was just like wow <laughs> so I knew that like it was a thing but other than that one instance like I never really thought about it or heard about it much after until recently and so like up until like the last couple of years and I just I'm really surprised because like I said, I feel like I've always been able to see Jesus and that kind of stuff. Like the hero and the sacrifice and the love and things like that. But anyway, so yeah, um, I prayed about it and then the next day Melissa Doherty had posted a video talking about how there's a difference between like what the Bible is calling witchcraft, which is obviously like the real witchcraft, and then what movies and books often are about. Uh, there's a difference. Um, I had said that like when the Bible talks about warning us against witchcraft, I don't think it was talking about... <laughs> Sorry, I keep trying to like pull his face so that he doesn't keep chewing on his foot because it's so loud. Um, I don't think it was talking about like fantasy stuff. Like, I don't know, to me there's such a big difference. Like, I don't read books that have to do with real witchcraft and real occult and things like that. Of course not, because there is a line. There are, There is the real side of it and the not real side of it, so... 
I don't know, anyway, but it's just been on my mind a lot lately, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because, one, it's something that I was literally just reading about when I was doing my Bible study. But I had just done my Bible study, I'm currently reading John 15, and then I took a shower, and like the whole time I was in the shower just like praying and talking to God about this because I recently came to the knowledge that like there's a whole like Christian community group that think that C.S. Lewis was just like a huge heretic. And I had no idea. I had no idea because obviously I read Mere Christianity and the Screw Tape Letters and both were just so beautiful and profound and taught so many great lessons and so much biblical truth and I just found them to be so informative and wonderful. But there is this whole community of Christians who think, like I said, that C.S. Lewis was a heretic and I even found this one blog who talked about how like this person truly believes that C.S. Lewis is in hell and like was never saved and just all of this stuff and I was so shocked. So shocked. And so I was reading what um, reasons they had for it. Really when it comes down to it I'm like okay. <laughs> so he believed in some things that maybe are different from what other Christians believe. Like one of the beliefs that he holds that I don't is like purgatory. He, he was not Catholic but um, purgatory was one of the teachings that he took from the Catholic Church that he believed in and it's like okay. And another one was some people claim that he was a universalist which is the belief that everyone will eventually make it to heaven. But the quotes that they used from him I feel like they were taken out of context. So <laughs> I don't know it's just so hard because it's like you can't believe everything that you read or see you know what I mean. You kind of have to like do your own kind of deep dive on stuff. So when I look at like crossway.org, which is like a really popular Christian website, it says this specific article on here is titled what C.S. Lewis believed about hell and it starts out by saying it's a controversial subject um, because as a Protestant he seemed to believe in something like purgatory, which isn't hell because only the saved go to purgatory. It's like a cleansing that um, believers go through before heaven apparently. Even when it comes to this view of hell there's a kind of tension between thinking of it as something God inflicts upon people, the pouring out of God's wrath, and the idea that hell is something that humans choose which is self-inflicted misery. Lewis affirmed that hell is retributed wrath but tended to accent almost in everything he wrote the more self-inflicted side with statements like hell is locked from the inside. The Bible seems to talk a lot about the pouring out of God's wrath and yet what Lewis is talking about is something we do for ourselves. There can be kind of a tension. Um, further down, the person who wrote this article says that sinners are cast or thrown into hell into the lake of fire. That's the language of the Bible. At the same time, when Paul describes the wrath of God being poured out in Romans 1, it looks like an increasing process of dehumanization. God giving us over to our desires and finding what we become less and less human. Things come apart. This is where Lewis is brilliant in his depictions as hell is an everlasting ruin, a decay, crumbling, retreating into yourself, a loss of all rationality and joy, a plunging into misery. But it's a self-plunging. It's a gnawing and an ache, but it's oriented inward, downward into the abyss. It is in one sense the opposite of heaven. And then further down again, it says C.S. Lewis is trying to show the solidity, firmness, and reality of heaven over against the thinnest decay and movement toward nothing of hell. Whatever we can picture, it's going to be that or worse, but Lewis gets us some of the way towards thinking about it. So this was an example of somebody who maybe looks at C.S. Lewis's version or depiction of hell in a different light. So really just this to say that like, just because an influencer or an article you find it says something about somebody and their beliefs doesn't necessarily mean it's true because that blog that I had found he, they were talking about how C.S. Lewis doesn't believe in hell at all and that he's a universalist but again like I said the quotes that they were using by him were totally out of context. In the Christian world there are many many views on hell and I had no idea up until like the last two years really. Some people believe it is eternal torment like physical what kind of like a lot of people grew up being taught like the fire and brimstone kind of a thing. Some people believe that it's just like a mental torture. Some people believe that it's separation from God. So like the depiction of basically earth without any kind of goodness or morality. So basically just chaos all the time. Some people believe that it is um, like a metaphor for God's wrath and love on us and thus kind of concludes the universalist view. And so there are just like a lot of 
different interpretations. Uh, personally, I kind of fall in the boat of I think that hell is what the Bible says that it is, that it's eternal separation from God. Of course, there is the tiny part of me that hopes that I'm wrong, that hopes that, you know, one day people will eventually make it to heaven. I mean, that's wrong scripturally, but I mean, the human part of me wants everybody to get there eventually, especially when you're somebody who has, I'm not going to cry, whew, when you're somebody who has like family and friends who don't believe, you know? So anyway, I did not really intend on talking about any of this. So I'm sorry, this is kind of random, but I guess it's because obviously this book focuses on C.S. Lewis and I've kind of just come to realizing that like people will call anybody a heretic if even just one little thing contradicts maybe their belief or their interpretation because let's say C.S. Lewis is wrong about you know three major things what about the thousands of good and biblical things that he did believe and teach and the thousands of people that he's probably brought to Christ because of his writings if we were going to immediately call any pastor or teacher heretic simply because there is one or two or even three things that they got wrong who who would we listen to? And I'm not sure there's anyone on this earth who has 110% correct theology and biblical understanding. I don't know, I just find it so interesting that C.S. Lewis, somebody who is, like I said, has probably brought thousands and thousands of people to Christ, could be accused of something like this. But um, this one article that I found on northamanglican.com, I don't know how to say that, but um, he's talking about in The Great Divorce and how one of C.S. Lewis's characters was George MacDonald, who was C.S. Lewis's favorite author, who is also mentioned in this book, because um, George MacDonald was a universalist. And I appreciate um, this article where the author says, um, this concept in that book theoretically implies that God has made universalism a possibility while realistically acknowledging its impossibility due to man's own inability to universally choose sanctification over corruption even in the afterlife. MacDonald's inclusion within the story is illustrative of Lewis's own stereological development. It is telling that Lewis would utilize such a polarizing individual as one of the main characters within the work. This, of course, does not imply that Lewis agreed with him entirely, but rather that Lewis's own theology of salvation is broad and inclusive due to his consideration of MacDonald's own theology. It is even more telling exactly how Lewis chooses to use MacDonald's character within the book. The narrator notes that MacDonald's character was a universalist on Earth, and yet it seems as if he does not hold to such beliefs in the afterlife. McDonald's character responds saying, The choice of ways is before you, neither is closed. Any man may choose eternal death, those who choose it will have it. In other words, McDonald is recognizing that although the possibility of universal salvation exists, realistically, not all will choose salvation, even in the afterlife. This is a very, very long article. I read the entire thing, and it is very, very, very good. I would recommend looking into it if this is a topic that interests you. I think that in a lot of the ways that C.S. Lewis just called a heretic for these kinds of belief, I think it's important to maybe research into what he's actually saying and look at the context of what he's saying and whether he's saying outright that he believes it or if he maybe um, plays with that idea to expand what the Bible actually means with certain things, if that makes sense. And not so in changing the word, because obviously the Bible's perfect as it is, of course. But I think more so just um, giving us different angles to understand the word. And yeah, anyway, I don't want to speak too much because I feel like somebody, I'm going to end up getting called a heretic, I don't know. <laughs> I've had a lot on my mind. And like I said, that fantasy thing has been on my mind the last few days, and I think it's because I'm reading this book that talks about C.S. Lewis so much and fantasy so much and of course you know some of his most famous quotes have been in here in regards to like you know maybe one day you'll be old enough to read fairy tales again <laughs> and um, of course it talks about how Mr. Lewis got interested in fairy tales and mythology and things like that when he was younger which of course is another reason why a lot of Christians call him a heretic because he's into occult stories but Again, I don't know, this is something that I feel like I've gotten revelation on where I can just say that I can separate truth from fact. Like, I can read, um, like, all of these myths and legends and things of the like and not be influenced to take those in as truth. Like, I can read those and think that they 
teach good moral lessons and not like take it on as a religion. <laughs> I think I might have read this in that previous video that I mentioned, but I'm going to read it again because I really like this quote that I found, but it says, Mythological stories exist to provide an explanation for natural phenomena and occasionally teach some kind of moral lesson. Religion, by contrast, seeks to build a systematic framework by which humans should live and show them how they should relate to God. So there's a difference. Like, in my opinion, you can read myths and legends and learn moral lessons from them, but that doesn't mean you're going to take it on as your religion. And I think that's just like the lessons that I've been learning lately in regards to like whether you're pro or anti-fantasy, I can learn moral lessons and beautiful stories from fantasies. That doesn't mean I take it on as a religion. And some people will say, well, like, why read fantasy stories when you can read the Bible? Yeah, that's great, but I think God gave us an imagination as well so that we can learn lessons in other ways too. And that's okay. But anyway, I've been babbling for so long. This is obviously a topic that I can talk about forever. As I said 500 times now, I think I'm just going to read for a little bit. I have so much on my mind aside from all that that I wanted to talk about, but this video will be like an hour long. But I... I'm just going to read and I will see you guys later. begin <laughs> I love that book so much I'm sorry the lighting is weird it's been really foggy in Minnesota lately I haven't seen the sun in days <laughs> oh my gosh okay so yeah um like beyond five out of five <laughs> um I don't know this story just like speaks to my soul and the ending just wrecks me every time <laughs> every time as if I've read this a bunch I've read it twice but uh, I know for a fact that I will sob like this every single time I read it um <laughs> but it's both stop chewing on me it's both like because of the ending and because of like 
all the lessons that come from it too, you know? Like, if you've been here a while, I'm sure you know, but like, I'm definitely like, a big life lesson person. Like, when I read fiction stories, I get so much more than just a story out of them every time. I always look at, you know, different lessons to learn and things to apply to my life and um, characteristics to take from different characters and stuff like that. And this book is just so full of that, you know? Oh my gosh, get it together. Oh, this is just so good. <laughs> but <laughs> there are several quotes in this book, obviously, that make me sob. But the one that I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just so good. Um, it's at the ending. And this is not, I don't think it's a spoiler. But, um, I don't think it's a spoiler. It's not a spoiler. Anyway. <sighs> so it says, um, George, Dad says, It looks like you think the lion followed the author around for all of his life. I'm sorry, my voice is just not gonna, like, be well. George nods, I think the lion follows all of us around. We just have to look for him. <laughs> oh. I scoot George over, wrapping my arm around his shoulder as I sit on the bed. Well, how do we see him, I ask. George looks at me, then at Mom and Dad. <laughs> he opens his hand and then rests his palm over his heart, leaving it there on his chest as his only answer. <laughs> I need to take my sweater off because I'm getting all hot and crying. <sighs> Oh my gosh, there are so many moments in this book that made me cry, but that one was just so good. Um, there are just so many quotes in this book that I want to talk about. Oh my gosh, stop chewing on me. But I won't because this video is already pretty long and um, it'll be like two hours minimum if I wanted to talk about all the quotes that I loved. Oh gosh, but... I think one of the things that really just makes this book top tier for me is the fact that it involved such a wholesome, beautiful romance story in it as well. Like, the romance between Megs and Padraig is just like my favorite thing ever. I just love the wholesome, beautiful romance between them and it's just, it's everything. It's the perfect kind of romance and I love it. He is like charming and funny and witty and imaginative and just wonderful and Meg's is just I don't know how to explain it I just love their romance and I feel like this book would for sure probably still be a five out of five without it but I feel like having this wholesome beautiful sweet romance in the book just was the cherry on top just made it so top tier and put it above and beyond you know and I just love it so so much especially when you read the ending and how everything came together with it. It was just like the most beautiful thing. I definitely want everybody to read this book because it's just, it's just the best. Okay, I'm gonna give myself a few minutes to pull myself together and cry and finish annotating and then I'll close this out with a few thoughts. I'm a little bit better now. <laughs> I just highly recommend this book. I just think it's so well written and it's a beautiful story and it's inspiring and really encouraging and I love it and there's just so many quotes that I've taken out of this to apply to my life and I definitely plan on going through this over the next few days and journaling stuff. I think it might have been from the page Calico and Twine but I got that idea from her where she read a book and then she goes through it and like journals notes and stuff that she doesn't want to forget and mind you I think she does that more so with like nonfiction, but I think that this is definitely just as applicable for sure and it's just it's so beautiful and again I'm not going to go through all the quotes that I love because this would take forever but I also wanted to say that I think this is so timely for me to be reading because as I'm sure you've noticed maybe over this video and the one where I talked about fiction and stuff that I'd already mentioned about Christians reading like fantasy and things like that I just find this all so timely because 
in my book club that I'm reading this with, which is just two friends that I met on Instagram, we all decided to read each other's favorite books. And we're starting with mine because of the winter theme in this one. And I just find it very interesting that it just happens to be about the importance of storytelling and fantasy and stuff like that and how it can help us grow and see God in a new light and it's just so encouraging and I love it. And also I wanted to mention that, oh, sorry now my eyes are all itchy because they're all salty. <laughs> I was obviously talking about it like a couple clips ago about like C.S. Lewis and theology and stuff like that and how some people are really strongly against C.S. Lewis, even his fiction books, because of some of his theology that he holds on to. And mind you, I think a lot of it is definitely taken out of context when people come against him, but the day after that, that I had filmed that clip, I had watched this interview with these, I want to say like four or five pastors, I can't remember all their names, I remember that one of them was Randy Alcorn, but they did like this whole thing about how C.S. Lewis has helped shape them into believers and how it's okay to, basically kind of what I was saying, where it's like eat the meat and spit out the bones, like yes, there are certainly things that C.S. Lewis was theologically incorrect about, but that doesn't mean that you have to like throw out everything everything that he's ever said. And other thing to realize is that C.S. Lewis never claimed to be a theologian. He never claimed to have any kind of spiritual authority, like all the books that he wrote were fiction. And even like the screw tape letters in Mere Christianity, he wasn't, I don't think he was writing those with the intention of them being like a theological like guidebook, you know what I mean? Like these were just his experiences and his thoughts. And they talked about maybe one of the Narnia books, I can't remember, but there's one Thing that um, is like a theological debate I guess among people with Lewis is that one of his characters you know served like a false god like a pagan god his whole life and then when this character died and met the real god after death he repented and God said it's okay I'll just apply everything that you did for your false god to me and then you get to go to heaven where like that's not theologically correct and the pastors were talking about how like that would make sense if the man like repented before he died but there's no chance after you're dead. And so that was one thing that um, some people really dislike about Lewis but again they've kind of put it in the context of like this is a fictional story first of all and second of all just because you disagree with him on one thing doesn't mean you have to throw out all the other amazing things that he said or talked about. And I think that's really important and I think it's important just to remember that like we are all responsible for ourselves and it's important to be responsible with your faith walk. If you read something in a book, make sure you compare it to scripture. Just because a Christian says it, even a pastor, doesn't mean that it's true. We have to compare it to the word every time. A lot of the places C.S. Lewis is correct and in some places he's not. And guess what? The only man with 100% correct theology was Jesus Christ. Okay? like. There are a lot of people that say if your pastor's ever said something wrong from the pulpit then you need to find a new church and it's like then you're gonna be church hopping for the rest of forever because I think I mentioned this in my last clip like nobody's gonna have perfect theology you know like we have to be self accountable and compare everything. Anyway I have been talking about that for a long time. I did not intend for this video to be so theologically packed but here we are. I guess it happens when you read a book like this and it just sparks all the things. Overall, I'm just so grateful that God has given us stories and imagination and things like that to learn from as well as the Bible. And it's just really beautiful. And I've learned a lot from this book and it made me feel all the feels and I'm excited to go through and journal some things and I just, I just love it. Get this book, read it. It's definitely more of like a Christmas timey book because there is like a Christmas moment at the end. My next read, or I guess now my current read, is Redeeming Love by Francine Rivers. I'm really hoping that I get into it. I'm a little nervous because it is like a western themed kind of book and I that's not really my vibe. Like I'm more of like a rainy Scottish highlands in the woodlands mountains kind of a person so I'm hoping that I can still vibe with it. Anyway I've been talking for a very long time and really I just want to say please read this book you'll love it. I love it so much. My favorite book for sure. Thank you guys so much for being here and watching me cry and get through this and I'm excited to talk to you guys soon about my next book. I love you very very much and I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.